Welcome to the Healing Trauma Through Conscious Embodiment Summit, revealing your body's wisdom and utilizing creativity and healing. My name is Greg Westwood and I'm your host. My work depth integration utilizes meditation, breath work, inquiry, journey work, and movement as conscious embodiment tools for healing. The purpose of this summit is to support participants who are looking for that deeper and longer lasting healing that conscious embodiment tools support by revealing their body's wisdom and utilizing creativity and imagination and healing. My intent is to educate, motivate, and inspire each of us to take empowered steps in our healing journeys. I am pleased to announce our guests today, Dr. Swamini Svatma Vidyananda. The doctor has taught at several universities nationally, including University of California, Berkeley. She is widely recognized as a scholar of Advaita Vedanta. She is widely in demand for lectures and seminars in the United States and internationally for her expertise in inter-religious engagement and in-depth training and scholarship in her work. I'm so honored to have you here today, Swamini. Swamini's topic today is rituals and healing in the Hindu tradition. Thank you. Thank you for your project and which I think is extremely worthwhile, especially considering the, uh, the pandemic and the global trauma that one is experiencing currently, which as you know, activates and re-stimulates things from the past. So there is a, you know, so there is a general uh, aspect to this and also the specific ways in which it affects people. So this, uh, your project is very timely and I'm very honored and happy to be delighted to be participating in this. And uh, I will just uh, share a few thoughts on uh, healing in the Hindu tradition we will be talking a little bit about rituals as well, because it's, uh, it is, uh, uh, your project is all about embodiment. And so that is a important aspect of that. Uh, but the healing is uh, on two levels. And I will be talking about the relative and the absolute, both of them, so that uh, this would be yet another window to explore, uh, you know, uh, various modalities to be integrated and more whole. And that is exactly, regardless of uh, any religious tradition, that is exactly what the uh, various prayers, practices in the traditions, in the various uh, religions espouse. In the uh, Hindu tradition, we have a uh, we have a natural, a kind of an organic bifurcation, and the bifurcation is between, uh, on the one hand, our everyday lived realities, the way we embody our beliefs and the, the kind of practices with which we integrate uh, with the rest of the society, with ourselves and with what we call Ishvara God. So this is the, the everydayness of the tradition. And here is where practices, rituals, lifestyle are very, very important. And they are all uh, designed and they speak to the other half of the Hindu tradition, which is its philosophy. 
Advaita Vedanta, which is the ultimate expression of this philosophy, which in a word, in a sentence says, everything that is here, known and unknown is all one, including oneself. It is all one. So in a, uh, in a word, it is you are that which you seek to be, you are limitless, you are without boundaries, you are not confined to this body mind sense complex which you inhabit, which you indwell, and but you are all pervasive in the form of that awareness. Because when I ask you, do you exist? You might say, what kind of a question is it? Are you here? But then you have to say yes, because there is no other answer available. And this itself shows that the I is self-existent, self-aware, self-existent. And, and so that itself becomes the basis for this philosophy. Because if the I is self-existent, then we say, okay, what else in the world is self-existent? And we find that there is nothing else in the world that is self-existent other than I. Anything uh, has, I have to cognize, everything becomes evident to me, but I don't become evident to any other source of awareness or consciousness. And the nature of this consciousness in the vision of the Vedas, the holy book, the holy books of the Hindu tradition, in the vision of the Vedas, this I is free of trauma, free of strife, free of anything that one wants to be free of in this everyday. So these, these comprise the two, you know, the, the, the two realities. One is the relative or the immanent and the other is the absolute or the transcendental. And then somehow the trick, the magic is to connect the two uh, in order to in order to have the fullest expression of, uh, of oneself. So the lifestyle, the first part of the, uh, what I talked about, the practices and the lifestyle, they are conducive to gaining this and assimilating this vision, which is the subject matter of texts like Bhagavad Gita, etc. And the Upanishads, which are, that is why it is called Vedanta, Anta means at the end, Veda is the holy books. So this, th those which appear at the end. So why don't they appear in the beginning? They don't appear in the beginning because we are, as uh, human beings are not ready. We have, to, we have to have certain practices and we have to graduate into assimilating this, this vision. So the most of the tradition is about gaining some uh, readiness. And that readiness has to do with growing emotionally, growing emotionally and having some uh, semblance of emotional maturity is extremely crucial. It's extremely important so that one is able to uh, assimilate this this philosophy, this knowledge that one is free and one is whole. But then human beings and human existence is extremely complicated. It's not so simple. So we have uh, trauma, we have difficulties, we have uh, all kinds of things that come in our way. And that is why we have the, uh, the first part of the Vedas which talk about uh, rituals, which talk about various practices. So I will be in general speaking about two kinds of practices. One is what is called, uh, in, in, in English, we would call it religious, and the other one, we would call it secular. Now, why these quotes, why these air quotes? The air quotes are because in, the, in our tradition, we make no such distinction. 
there is no such distinction eating uh, drinking uh, etc which are seen as secular acts generally speaking in the tradition are very much <coughs> part of who we are and they are not seen as secular they are also seen as spiritual so there is zero distinction in our tradition between the spiritual and the secular but for sake of easy comprehension so i i made this distinction so that we can uh, better uh, assimilate uh, the 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 nuances of this tradition so speaking of spiritual practices we have uh, you know we have three forms of prayer generally speaking one is called physicalized or ritualized prayer the other one is verbal prayer where you can sing where you can chant all these things and then and the third kind of prayer is mental prayer also known as meditation so when we look deeply into these forms of prayers we find that all of them are geared towards finding some solace and uh, healing so many things so first with the ritualized prayer we have very long and various kinds of uh, rituals the fire rituals which involve the elements fire water and so many air we bring in all that and then we have uh, more of a this of course is more formal and many times the lay people do not know how to do the fire ritual anymore so one is dependent upon priests etc to chant the mantras and to offer things into the fire uh, um, and then there are these everyday rituals which one can do on one's own and in both of them there are some very interesting ways in which are designed to heal and clear clear one of uh, difficulties uh, in one's life and all trauma we say is has got some karmic roots so i don't mean to imply that if one has had a traumatic background that there is you know it is all because of their karma no uh, but it has some kind of a karmic root why this parentage why these siblings why this particular kind of a background so then those karmic difficulties are neutralized by various kinds of physicalized or ritualized prayer mental prayer etc so in the physicalized prayer in the uh, uh, first we will talk about the everyday prayer that is done in homes there is a very interesting way of uh, connecting to the to the goddess connecting to the lord because we have this idea of of the lord being present in in all aspects of the creation and it can, uh, and this force can be invoked as masculine or feminine and it doesn't matter and so when we invoke this being uh, in through various forms and functions that one being is invoked through various forms and functions it takes the format of inviting a special guest into the house and then uh, you know offering certain things and you you invite the guest into the house give them water this is how in ancient india a guest would be uh, honored and invited you invite the person into the house you give them water to wash their feet you give them some some fruit juice to drink uh of uh, something cool to drink it if it is summer something warm if it is winter and then you give them a nice seat and then you make uh, their bath ready and then you uh, invite them to take a bath and then you offer them new clothes you offer them a feast and then you ritually send them off now this this kind of a ritual a step by step ritual and it is called a 16 step ritual this has got a uh, 16 steps involved in it and then uh, here what happens is you know two things happen one is that 
in the process of doing this elaborate step-by-step -step thing oh did i forget the step number seven did i did i do this or not am i offering this properly or not in this there is a some way of um being able to extricate oneself from the preoccupation with oneself it it gives a it gives that inner space through focusing on something bigger and greater than oneself and connecting to that force as you know as the truth of oneself ultimately so that is one thing and the second thing that it does is that whatever you do to the guest is something that you want uh, uh, to happen to you and that is how uh, in the tradition you say uh, you will you know i offer you this from my heart and then you know this is exactly how i would be wanting to be treated so the the icon or the image or the photograph whatever one is using to connect to this uh, entity which is the truth of oneself in any name in any form becomes a proxy for being able to see oneself as as whole as not broken up into pieces as not shattered as as complete free and whole and limitless so in this process uh, in a way it is actually like looking into the mirror and performing these rituals so that uh, the idea is that the same mantras that we chant are the same uh, when we do this puja are the same mantras that we chant when we ourselves bathe when we ourselves eat it's the same thing exactly the same thing and so this non separateness it it, uh, it uh, uh, reinforces the immanent presence of god of ishvara everywhere and at the same time it uh, it is designed to increase one's self esteem because the prayers say after all you indwell me and so every kind of uh, uh, whatever is done to this body in the course of the every day such as bathing uh, eating drinking etc is all an offering to the divine that is to the presence that is indwelling this body mind sense complex and that is really really healing because one starts to see oneself in the in the light of advaita vedanta in the light of this connection to the whole in the light of the fact that that same uh, what i worship uh, in the in the in the what we call the puja room or the worship room uh, is the same as that which indwells me in the form of this presence which i cannot objectify and that is why it is uh, you know one one takes uh, the help of an aid such as a photograph or an image one is not worshiping the idol one is worshiping that which the idol symbolizes one is worshiping god through a medium that is the that is the everyday uh, ritual then we also in the everyday ritual also before one starts one has certain cleansing practices where one starts from the head and ends to the toe toe or, or one starts from the toes and goes all the way up to the head every single body part is named and touched and and it uh, you know and the idea is it is called nyasa nyasa means you know letting go in a certain sense and uh, nyasa also means treasure these two things become very uh, these meanings become very uh, uh, wonderful they they have uh, an extremely uh, become very pertinent uh, in the light of our discussion because when you touch a certain body part and you say that you know let the uh, let the feet be uh, an embodiment an incarnation of lord vishnu vishnu means all pervasive and so the feet and the legs you know let them be informed by the presence of vishnu means even though i can only move so much i can only walk so many miles per day 
I am all pervasive. So each body part is named, each body part is healed in the sense that one says, this is, you know, let, let everything you know, be, uh, let everything be cleansed. Let all the memories that are stored in those body parts, uh, some difficulties and some traumatic experiences be cleansed by the presence of that particular deity, Adhishthana Devata, that particular deity uh, residing in those uh, body parts or helping those body parts function. And so this way, this, you know, this takes up a, a, a good amount of time, the cleansing the organ of speech, cleansing the eyes, so that one is brought out of the subjective realm of looking at one's life uh, with pain, with sorrow, and with some kind of diffidence to seeing that uh, th that one is actually integrated to the whole, that one is not some kind of an alienated, isolated being who has been, uh, who has been traumatized or has, uh, you know, is having some difficulties and challenges that uh, one faces in one's life. So this is, you know, this is the, this is the, the effect of the physicalized ritual. And in the fire rituals, you know, it is very, very beautiful to be uh, offering the, the uh, clarified butter called ghee into the fire repeatedly. And this is done in a groove. This also is very healing because you're staring at the fire and the, the name of the uh, uh, fire is called pavaka, which means the great cleanser, the great healer. So this is how the physicalized prayer works uh, in connection to um, understanding uh, that there is space between whatever I, I am enduring and I have endured at the level of this body-mind complex and myself, the whole, to which I am connecting in the form of Goddess, Lord, so many names, so many forms. And then we have uh, the chanting uh, or the singing the or um, any kind of reading and this constitutes what is called verbal prayer there also there is a uh, there is a that connection which overrides the alienated experiences of the individual then we have meditation and in the meditation also the, uh, the the effort is made to have some kind of a space between the person who is an embodied person uh, with various experiences and the person who is separate from those experiences who is the truth of all the experiences in whose presence the experiences unfold in in whose presence the experiences are sustained in whose presence the experiences resolve and so that person is is uh, is that witness sakshi to whom one connects and so therefore in the meditation one makes uh, the, the preparation for the meditation is very, very healing because and the meditation also. But in the preparation, uh, we talk about specifically the, the difference between the inner child and the adult. This is something which is very unique. Um, I mean, maybe other traditions have it, but I have encountered it very, very specifically in the uh, in the Hindu, in the Vedic tradition, in the Hindu tradition. Uh, the uh, an ancient Acharya teacher talks about this. His name is Gaudapada, and this um, teacher called Gaudapada says that in the process of meditation, the inner child will come out in the form of bubbles, bubbles of pain, bubbles of difficulties, bubbles of memories, bubbles of challenges. Sometimes those bubbles are actually joyous. Sometimes they are painful. But please know that they come from the past, uh, of a, they come from your past 
and what is expressing and running the show of this past, uh, the unfolding in the present is a truncated being who has not absorbed yet the lessons of the journey and who cannot be got rid of, who need not be got rid of, but must be integrated with love and with clarity. Look upon this being with love. Look upon this being with dispassion. And this is something so beautiful. And we have this, uh, you know, so when the difficult uh, memories come up, uh, you, you uh, watch. You watch. How do you watch? You watch like a loving mother uh, watches a child having a tantrum in front of the toy store, perhaps. <laughs> so the parents know, OK, <laughs> you know, he or she, the, this, this child, it will get over it. It is part of growing up. Yes, you know, it wants this toy yesterday, but it's not going to have it right now and it will get over it. But at the same time, I don't hate this child. I love this child. This is my child. And so this way, the mother is, um, is not uh, buying into the upset, just like the parents, the mother and the father are not buying into the upset of the child and they are not participating and identifying with its difficulties and traumatic experience of not getting what it wants. Similarly, one uh, looks upon all these parts of oneself in the meditation with as much compassion and love that one can muster. Then this is, uh, then we are taught to gain the space between the parentage and oneself. Suddenly, one in the process of meditation, uh, one discovers that one has two sets of parents. <laughs> one external, they are who they are, they were who they were. This is how they were, this is how they are in one's perception. And that is also important to acknowledge because one's perception may be right, may need not be right. And then the other set of parents are internalized, they are internal or rather internalized in the form of early hurts, pains, sorrows over which one has, uh, you know, over which one has no say. And so this way there is a, there is a split and, uh, and also the, uh, the internalized parents include, um, expectations of that inner child that cannot be met that need not even be met but the, but those hurts and pains of expectations i wish she were different i wish he were different you know cast a pall on one's daily expression of that wholeness which uh, which is the truth of the uh, uh, the philosophy of the tradition which one aspires to embody and so therefore, the first part of the meditation is keeping things in their places where they belong. This is an advice from the fifth and the sixth chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, which talk about meditation. The latter half of the fifth chapter and the beginning of the uh, sixth chapter, they talk about meditation. And then, uh, so they say, uh, you know, in, in this Lord Krishna says, Sparshan bahyan bahihi kritva, keeping the external world outside. This is a very strange directive to prepare for meditation. How can I keep the external world outside when it's already outside? One may argue, but it is to talk, it is focusing on that which is internalized. So we start with the parentage and we uh, uh, take each person, we take the caregivers who sometimes due to, uh, due to the trauma don't become primary, they, they are not, no longer primary caregivers, they are primary scare givers. You have to put an S there in front and then as a result, it, there is so much pain and sorrow. So we see them uh, as objectively as possible by granting each person the freedom to be who they are, who they were. This is how you were. This is how you are. And then you, uh, uh, you offload the internalized parents 
and then you become ready to meditate upon the truth of your very being and so this is something which is uh, which is very very beautiful and you do this as many times as needed and you do this not just to the parents but to the significant other to the children to whatever it is you visualize them and give them the freedom to be who they are and in so doing you are free from their expectations you are free from your expectations uh, with regard to them you are you are able to see them objectively you're able to see them uh, you know with their flaws with their challenges with their talents with with everything and that uh, is very very important for this integration then we have in the tradition a particular uh, manifestation of lord shiva in uh, in uh, two or three forms one is nataraja the lord of dance and the dance being the dance of the universe which is always in flux and in movement and then the other one is the uh, is the teacher uh, lord dakshina murti and this uh, uh, this teacher is the teacher of this philosophy you are whole you are myself and uh, so uh, in in both these uh, iconography you find that the lord is standing or seated the the, the image and then at the foot of the lord there is this small being crouched at the right foot is on uh, gently on this small little what looks like a child then upon closer the first you think why is the lord stepping on this child <laughs> then upon closer inspection when you go closer and you see it is no child so to speak it's just a child within quotes it's got a big mustache <laughs> and it's got a shield in one hand and a dagger in the other offensive and defensive and so this is something which is very interesting this is the inner child and that is uh, this is the collective inner child of the entire humanity which is surrendered to the feet of the lord and the lord just says heal pun intended and so so uh, you know this is how it cannot be got rid of because it is not something to get rid of it is something to be loved up and integrated into the adult and so it is surrendered and so as one grows in the tradition the shield which is the defensiveness drops which is again an outcome of the trauma and the offensiveness of attacking because i was attacked that feeling also slowly is surrendered and then one grows to uh, uh, integrate these these difficulties and the unconscious uh, into the adult and with regard to the unconscious mind there is a uh, very beautiful teaching know that it exists and know that you don't have to do anything about it other than witness it with love other than love it up it is just how it is and so this constitutes the so called the spiritual um, aspect of the practices uh, which are uh, really geared towards healing then we come to the uh, secular practices which are again very spiritual in our tradition and uh, we find that especially the uh, the the pra these practices have a very important uh, uh, role a very salient role right now especially when we are in the process of going 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 all the time i find that you know we live life in the form of very very uh, difficult uh, and violent metaphors nobody gets up what do we do we threw off the i threw off the covers people tell me and then if i'm phoning somebody i they say i'll call you right back i'm going to jump into the shower why jump but this is how we this is how we talk this is how we are and then what do you do after you jump into the shower i grabbed a bite to eat grab again here violent metaphors then i ran out the door or i hit the road there, there is even one song like this hit the road jack or something like that an old song and and then you hit the road and then what did you do after hit the you hit the road to go to work and then you cranked out some emails 
and then of course one becomes cranky as a result of that and on the way to the office you hit the road on the way back you beat the traffic again it's all these violent ways in which we do and nobody cooks after coming home you throw something together you throw something together and if you're a teenager you go one step further and you say oh i just nuked it and <laughs> meaning i put it in a microwave <laughs> it is very funny <laughs> very very strange and then after that nobody goes to sleep i crashed i crashed and so this is how you know if 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 one lives if I, if one is living life this way no wonder there is you know there is trauma every day no wonder there is a sense of alienation no wonder there is pain no wonder there is disconnection no wonder there is the, the life seems meaningless purposeless there is no feeling that i'm making a difference there is no difference between one's self and a robot you know nowadays even the computer get gets viruses and then what the computer also crashes and then there is no difference at all and so therefore in the in the tradition uh, we are advised to do this daily uh, what are called the secular practices also uh, to spiritualize those secular practices to see everything that one does as a prayer so waking up is an act of prayer so you bring in that prayer in into the uh, the most mundane tasks of the everyday waking up is an act of prayer you're supposed to look at your hands which are the organs of actions and you're supposed to you know and there is a small chant which says may my fingertips be be informed be uh, abided by the goddess of abundance may knowledge back my actions and then the feet touch the ground there is the prayer for mother earth oh mother i don't know what i did yesterday let me not step on you today in vain nobody jumps into the shower you invite the holy rivers of india to to bathe you and nobody grabs a bite to eat because the lord is the form of the hunger the fire of hunger is a manifestation of the lord and so whatever you eat is an offering it has to be done mindfully silently and it's a communion with with the with oneself so therefore you cannot use the expression junk and food in the same sentence because this is not a garbage bin this is this is an offering the body the stomach is not a garbage can uh, uh, where you, you you are putting some kind of a refuse and uh, so therefore there is that that integration with what one eats uh, is there and how much one eats when one eats is all uh, very much part of this uh, this prayer then work itself whatever one does in one's life is called swadharma through which i express my talents through which i am integrated to the uh, to the world to the whole and then that itself is an act of prayer then cooking is an act of prayer and then sleeping also is an act of prayer so before one goes to sleep one says whatever i have done today whatever i have you know not been proud of let it let it just be forgiven let me above all forgive myself and let me above all go forth to the next day go forth into this next little world with with clarity with objectivity so in this way even the uh, the everyday expressions of who we are are designed to 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 be uh, to convert one from a person who prays where prayer is a distinct act uh, to a person who is prayerful where everything that the person does is informed by the attitude of prayer and all these are designed for uh, for bringing out uh, the the objective person not the person who is identifying with the trauma but the person who is um, in and through who has survived this trauma who is intact 
who is able to understand that one is not afflicted by anything uh, or disturbed by anything in this universe, that one is indeed one with the creator. And so in this way, it is, uh, it is geared towards healing and it is very much uh, embodied. And all this is to prepare for this knowledge which takes years of study and years of assimilation. And without this preparation, without this relative uh, integration, uh, this uh, understanding of oneself as absolute is not possible at all. So the two uh, um, areas, uh, the one of the everyday and the one of understanding oneself as uh, transcending the everyday are very much connected. So let me stop here and see if you have any questions or if you would like to add anything to what I have said or if anything wasn't clear, I can take the time to clarify. No, I think it was a, just a beautiful presentation of, um, of, of your rituals and, and I, um, we're, we're so missing that in our culture here in the United States. Um, and yeah, I, I have no questions. It was a very beautiful, complete presentation. Do you have any final words that you would like to share? Uh, yes, one small thing I can say, <clears throat> this might be of use. Uh, instead, you see the, 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 the crux here is instead of looking to be saved, looking to be healed from some external source, one makes oneself able to do that for oneself. That is the uh, point of all these practices. We have uh, a saying at the end of a very holy prayer called the Rudram. And um, in Sanskrit, it is just very beautiful. You know, you pray to, to, to say, these are my hands. I am me hasto bhagavan, I am me bhagavattaraha, I am me e vishwabhe e shajo yagam shiva bhimarshanaha, ye te sahastra mayutam pasha, mrityo martya yahantave, tan yagnyasya maya yasar vanava yajamahi, mrityo bhe swaha, mrityo bhe swaha. Very beautiful. It says, These are my hands, O Lord. And I know that in invoking your name and in invoking your presence, in the healing uh, uh, herbs, uh, all the healing herbs of the universe, may they enter into these hands just by invoking your name. And so that I have the ability to touch wherever it hurts, wherever it is there, for myself and for others. May I borrow this healing ability from you so that uh, even if death comes and stares at the face, I can ward it off with, with these hands. So death is not, uh, you know, death is this everyday death of, of pain, of sorrow, these little, little deaths, yeah, how one, uh, you know, uh, how one, uh, uh, well, well, you know, how one basically truncates oneself, how one abridges and punctuates oneself to be small. That is that smallness is what we call death. So this is something which is very beautiful. So we, uh, we have this prayer ending on a note of self-affirmation and uh, having the confidence to greet whatever challenges come, either from the unconscious mind or from without, either from the past or in the present, that I am very, I'm so connected to everything that I have the ability, I have been given the ability to also heal this and to also go beyond this. That is something I wanted to share. Thank you so much Thank for you. inviting me and may all beings be happy and may all beings be free from pain and may we all see the best in ourselves and each other. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just am becoming so aware of how much body-centered therapies, you know, embodiment therapies in this culture have so much that they owe to 
the Hindu uh, traditions and rituals, um, because so many of those ideas and practices are, are used in our, our sessions and we support that in, in, our, in our clients. So, so thank you, I thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. You take care and best of luck for your project. <laughs>